<laughs> Hello and welcome to the Money Marketing Podcast. I'm Kimberly Dunder, Digital Content Manager, and we are back again in a new in the new year. Uh, this is our first episode of the year as the editorial team. So I'll let everyone introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Tom Brown. I'm ed- editor of Money Marketing. Hi, Dan Cooper, news editor. Lois Fallerly, chief reporter. Darius McQuaid, reporter. Okay, fantastic. Thank you guys for joining me. And it's quite late into the year, but I still want to say Happy New Year since this is our first editorial podcast as a team. Um, And January has been quite a busy month, as it always is. So I want to know what you guys have been up to in January um, and what stood out for you. So, Tom, do you want to get us started with uh, what stood out for you that you worked on in January? Well, um, I think the story that sort of stood out to me for slightly sort of personal reasons was this uh, new cash hub that Quilter has launched on their platform, uh, mm-hmm. largely because um, I've done a uh, MM meets with uh, Stephen Levin, who's the CEO of Quilter. That's going to come up in a future issue. But uh, mm-hmm. he was talking a lot about the platforms and the various different sort of enhancements and upgrades that they've made over the years. And we've reported on that quite a bit. And this new cash hub thing that provides access to a range of banks and savings accounts and mm-hmm. also allows advisors and clients to see their cash savings alongside their quilter platform investments, which is another enhancement to their award winning platform. But it was the fact that um, they kind of talked to tell, told us about this quite early on and we got the scoop on it. So uh, which Dan then wrote up. So I was pleased about that. And it seemed to get very good traction on, on the website. But other than that, I mean, one of many, many interesting things that we've done done this year. But that was the one that kind of first came to mind. Yeah, definitely. We'd love a good scoop. Um, um, and Lois, what about you? What stood out for you in January? Well, I've been really enjoying this art class that I've been doing. And the yeah. other day I did a pottery workshop. Oh, you meant work-wise, right? Yeah. Oh, okay, I mean, sorry. I'm sure the <laughs> audience might love to hear about your pottery, but maybe that'll be another podcast we can launch. I'll put a photo on X so everyone yeah. can see it. Yeah. yeah, I could be. Um, I could have talked about it. my cookery if he wasn't here. But, <laughs> but no. <laughs> um, no. So okay, work wise, fine. Um, so I went to a interesting event the other day, um, Schroeder's uh, Financial Advisor Forum, mm-hmm. um, and so their group CEO Peter Harrison was speaking, and he had some really interesting. I'm using interesting again. It's like this is supposed to be a New Year's resolution, right? He had some really <laughs> fascinating points and one Mm. of the points he made was um you know the financial conduct authorities advice guidance plans that it published um i think it was end of last year Mm -hmm. um which it wants to sort of widen access to financial advice or support for people um Mm -hmm. and one of the proposals um is a new form of simplified advice um that makes it easier hopefully makes it easier for firms to provide affordable personal recommendations to clients um, right. but peter harrison schroeder's group ceo thinks that maybe they might have been watered down slightly the proposals to get them through the regulatory and um legislative process that they need to go through right. so he doesn't think they're actually going to make much of a different a difference to the advice gap obviously advice gap can be defined as different things so you know there's some people who maybe have a lot of money and could massively benefit from full fat financial advice but Mm -hmm. don't know where to get it or don't even know that they should be getting it but then there's Mm -hmm. also these people who fall into the bracket of people who maybe don't have enough to yeah be of interest to financial advisors and have full Mm -hmm. fat advice but could benefit from some some form of guidance which is what the fca is sort of trying to address but yeah uh, peter harrison thinks that maybe they've been watered down slightly like i say so i think his specific words were they've been sort of turned into things like oh this might work for you as a per if you've got this this might work for you which is kind of already out there a little bit and he was arguing that it's actually we need things done in a completely different way to help advisors become more efficient so that they have more time to serve more clients and therefore can maybe serve more of the so-called in quotation marks less valuable clients as well as their 
really rich clients who probably make them the most money. So mm-hmm. I thought that was quite an interesting point. Um, he was pretty bold on some of the things he said, some of which I've been asked not to repeat in the exact wording that they were given. <laughs> oh, we don't want to start trouble or do we? <laughs> I don't know. Um, but no, it was a really, it was a very interesting um, note. I'm going to hit myself every time I say interesting. <laughs> no, it was a really eye opening. It was interesting. Opening it was interesting. Um, but yeah. yeah, that sounds that sounds. I don't not disappointing. I don't know um, that people might still not be able to gain advice just or guidance just because of where they sit. And I think that's probably going to be a large percentage of the UK population. Myself included. Yeah. Unless, you know, I sell that manuscript and make the big bucks. Um, <laughs> When's but, that happening, Kim? I don't know. I, I want to read it. Oh, um, Harry Katz. Most people know Harry Katz. Yeah. Suggested to me that I should write a book about mm-hmm. financial advisors and all the bad things that have happened and do it like a sort of a biography like a timeline no more like or more like a I think more like a, not, not a spy novel but more like a sort of crime novel or something I thought it was a great idea that I would also it. it could also be a really interesting like true crime podcast series you know yeah um we'll put a pin in that and circle back yeah um, so thanks for the su- suggestion Harry I may well do it <laughs> uh Darius what stood out for you in January <clears throat> Um, I, I did a, a few articles on um, sort of equities and predictions how the equity market is going to be uh, this year. And this seemed to be a, a, a sort of a theme of various uh, uh, companies um, giving out their opinions. So I, th- I thought it's a lot, a lot of there's um, quite a few, uh, you know, vocality around equities. Um, and um, what, uh, one uh, managing partners group uh, basically produced to be a choppy ride for equities 2024 um, mm-hmm. with the, the current economic climate and equities are going to feel it and uh, it just sort of spoke about <clears throat> more and more global um, issues at hand like you know the um, possibility of recessions and so forth and they thought mm-hmm. the UK will avoid a uh, recession um, but the US um, has uh, a greater, a bigger risk of it happening, but only during the first half of 2024. Um, okay. And then um, Goldman Sachs said uh, they um, th- they think US equities is actually an upward trend in asset class, and they compared it the past 15 years of performance of Chinese equities, and they said you know your typical investor would have uh, <clears throat> uh, seen more return on US equities compared to Chinese equities, um, mm-hmm. and uh, they thought. Uh, the possibility of recession hit the US this year was at 30%. So it was, it was just um, all these uh, sort of like these these various equities predictions sort of talking about similar matters and similar sort of themes. Um, and so yeah, no, I just thought it, was, it all came around, <coughs> you know, similar sort of time and I was able to write these articles and uh, hear these opinions and so forth. Uh, and, and also, you know, during January is the best time to make predictions for 2024 because, you know, you've got the, the biggest scope for it for it to actually um come to fruition as well so yeah and that was uh yeah i i quite like the, the predictions at the beginning of the year and clearly we're still in a position where not everything is um completely crystal and people have still got you know various opinions on the matters yeah because these that. things sounds like a feature in the making darius oh okay oh well there we go then it doubled up didn't it keep an eye out for that one um <laughs> But I find that when it comes to like predictions for like what the upcoming year, you always just hear the word volatility and they just kind of. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, true. Yeah, yeah, it's going to be volatile. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. And especially this year, it's like election year, possible wars. <laughs> but yeah, anyway, yeah, yeah. Dan, what's the out for you in January? Yeah, there's a couple of things really. So I went to um, the Empire empowering advice through technology conference mm-hmm. um miller jan and uh yeah a lot of uh a lot of really intriguing things that came up quite a lot around ai and mm-hmm. super ai which i've never heard of before but i am aware super. of now which apparently is the the um the point at which ai becomes equal to if not more powerful than the human mind which is a pretty scary thought and that's 2029 apparently is is the uh 
is the year we're all going to be replaced by by AI. It would be more um, powerful, though, because I feel like sometimes I have mm-hmm. what I call a brain fart where my brain just <laughs> just like, it's like I've forgotten what that word yeah. is. Um, whereas I think uh, AI will be able to be like, I've mm-hmm. connected a hundred different things immediately. Um, so that's be like that little paper, be like that little paperclip on Microsoft Word. It's like, <laughs> I can I can see you're thinking of this. May I suggest yeah. these words? Yeah. yeah. But um, yeah, no. So it was um, yeah, a lot of stuff around AI and obviously about the impact uh, on the advice sector, what it might mean going forward. And there was a lot of talk about power planners, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, again, talking about not not necessarily AI replacing them as such, but there was a lot of emphasis on the need for power planners to become data experts. You know, mm-hmm. saying that actually it, it will be the power planners who kind of embrace the technology and who learn to you know, use it properly and really become experts in the data they're the ones who will um you know stand the best chance of effectively not being made redundant not losing their jobs when mm-hmm. ai does sort of kind of take over what about that, if they all was... do what about if every <laughs> single one learns all about tech yeah. that's a very good point and that'd be <laughs> Might be a it kind of it, it kind of brought me back to when mm. I think when I first started um, at Money Marketing and yeah. there there was an article or something that was was so, so one of the editorial team had published questioning I don't know if it was a guest article actually or if it was uh, something that the editorial team had written um, and it was questioning whether power planners were as important as financial yeah. advisors, something like that. And it just got this massive debate going. Um, was it about whether know. power planning is a profession in itself? Yes. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Because I, people I wrote see it as a stepping that. stone to becoming, you know, mm. a financial advisor. You don't stay being a power planner forever. But some people were arguing, no, I enjoy being a power planner. I don't plan on going. Um over that but yeah i remember that being a i think topic. i've i've heard that it's power planners that are more at risk of um being made redundant from artificial intelligence more than actual financial advisors but i think it depends like what kind of power planning they do whether it's mm-hmm. just the admin tasks which could be replaced by technology or whether it's because lots of power planners do a lot more than just admin mm-hmm. so yeah. it depends what kind of power planner yeah, yeah, that was certainly the impression I got from the from the conference. You know, the, the kind of feeling in the room and the um, the things that Ian McKenna and, and others were saying was that it was that yeah, the power planners do seem to be, in their view, kind of more at risk for AI than, than perhaps planners or advisors. But um, and the other thing that I found quite quite um, interesting there, I said interesting too, <laughs> is um, was about um, <laughs> uh, about advice firms. Um, they don't have a client portal mm. uh, being being less valuable to, to potential buyers than those that do. Um, yeah, because so, it's a big was, investment to create one. Yeah, exactly. But it was, I think the, there was a stat was uh, only 55% of advice firms that um, have made a practice management portal available to clients, um, you know, which they said was disappointingly low. I mm-hmm. think over overall, sort of thirty eight percent of those surveyed have made an additional portal available, but quite a high number thought that giving clients two different portals kind of hinders the experience. So a lot around, yeah, a lot around client portals, a lot around AI. Um, and in terms of the the news front, um, there were a couple of stories which kind of stood out for me, which uh, both involved uh, potential job losses, which obviously never never great news. Um, mm-hmm. it's Aberdeen was kind of the big one. Um, and they are uh, cutting around about 500 jobs uh, as part of it's plan to save yeah. 150 million. Um, big chunk of that, big chunk of the savings they they're saying is going to be from the investment arm of the business as opposed to the advice. Why? Um, why do they need to save 150 um, million? They asked. I think the excuse they gave was res- restore our core investments business to an acceptable level of profitability. Okay. Um, yeah, it's just kind of saying that again going back to your thinking about volatility and you know they're saying that market conditions have kind of remained challenging and um mm-hmm. that's that sort of reflected in its end of year AUMA and 
flow numbers and margins. So yeah, that's that's quite a big story um, from January. And uh, the other one was Canada Life um, closing a, a couple of their products to the new business again, which not quite to the same extent as um, Aberdeen, but mm. um, you know will involve some kind of job losses. They were they were the two ones that stood out for me really. Yeah. Well, I've seen quite a bit about um, 2024 being mm. like another year of uh, major redundancies and job losses um, due to yeah. the potential of a recession, um, which is scary and sad. But I am going to switch gears and move, look forward to February, um, this beautiful month that we're in. The month of love, some might say, um, <laughs> depending if you celebrate. Um, but um, Dan, staying with you, um, what are you looking forward to in February or what have you already covered in February that you'd like to talk about? Uh, yeah, so uh, quite the, um, an interesting part that I thought was the uh, section of the cover feature, which mm-hmm. I've been writing around regulation. Mm-hmm. And about the you know the kind of being increased regulatory burden and the, and the the effect and the impacts on advice firms in the sort of twelve months ahead. I mean, towards the end of last year, we sort of had a felt like we had a kind of a wave of announcements from the FCA. We had the you know the polluter pays proposals, um, mm-hmm. you know, the discussion paper on the advice guys advice guidance boundary, mm-hmm. and all the sort of the SDR proposals and the, and, and changing the labels and so on. So. Um, yeah, it's, I mean, see, since RDR came in, it was over a decade ago now, it's, you know, kind of regulation is nothing new, but it does feel that this year is going to be a really a, kind of a seismic year in terms of you know, the pressure on firms to, to to not only keep up with it, but to, to actually implement it as well. And, you know, the, the cost of that as well, particularly on the on the smaller advice firms, the pressure that's going to put them under. Mm. Um, yeah, so that's the main one. And then... Um, yeah, that that was that's kind of the main the main thing really from, from my point of view. And um, the other things I wrote a leader about the uh, intergenerational wealth transfer. And right. Kind of, I kind of tied that in with inheritance tax, and um, you know, just just really in a nutshell, sort of five and a half trillion is going to be that they they predict is going to be transferred between the generations, you know, between the baby boomers and the millennials. Um, right. And. Schroders did a bit of research towards the end of last year saying that 63% of advisors are concerned that their business could lose assets during this wealth transfer. Um, but despite this, kind of only only 26% admit they don't have a kind of a clear planning strategy in place for their clients. So right. um, I think 75% of that- advisors said they believe it's important to create a, a relationship with their client's children, but only 17% have done so. Um, only 12% of advisors have formed a relationship with the client's grandchildren. So it's kind of like they, they're, they're concerned about losing the assets, but they're still they're not doing enough, anything about it. Enough work. Yeah, exactly. Enough work yeah. being put in to actually kind of stop those assets from walking out the door. Yeah. Um, and it's just really, it's, it, I, I don't know, it's funny or interesting to me because um, that's a conversation that I remember even when I launched in conversation with a lot of advisors I was talking to at the time, I was asking them about how they kind of interact with their clients and if they choose to interact, you know, with the rest of the family, whether it is, you know, the partner of their client or their children, if they have them mm. or whoever might be the one who gets those assets. And I think a, a pro, an issue that they face is that they don't want to step on anyone's toes or anything like that, I guess. Um, and it might be a bit awkward to start those conversations, but I, I think it's just something that needs to be done. Because otherwise just, you will lose business. They need to do it in a way that's not an obvious play for more business. Yeah. yeah. Just be like, have a family fun day event. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that's an easy way. Send out to all your clients, come to our event. It's a barbecue. Bring your family, bring your grandchildren. Actually, uh, Timothy James and Partners does that. They have events for their clients and their clients' families. Not exactly. quite barbecues, but like 
art exhibitions and stuff. Yeah. So it's things that will allow you to naturally engage with your client's extended family. Easy win. Well, actually a bad idea. <laughs> they should ask me for these marketing ideas. <laughs> um, uh, Lois, what about you? What's uh, What are you looking forward to in Feb? So for the February cover feature, I looked widely at demographics and how that might affect um, advice in the future. So I sort of started off talking about Generation Alpha. Obviously, mm-hmm. Generation Alpha is not yet old enough to be receiving financial advice. I think the oldest are in, I, I put in their tweens, so like yeah. 11 or 12, 13 yeah. maybe. I can't remember yeah. the exact um, boundaries. But yeah, um, but I mean, it's only going to be another 10 years when they might start looking at how they should be investing in the future. So 10 years in the great scheme of things isn't that long. So the one that, they're like on the internet and they're probably getting all and those they're probably like getting cryptocurrency ideas. things and seeing all those, all their favorite influences promoting some gambling thing. Yeah, exactly. So, so as soon as they have their own money, they're probably going to be as a generalization, obviously, they're mm-hmm. probably going to be looking at how they can save. invest or save or whatever they want to do with that money, spend. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but then Generation Alpha, no, I just said Generation Alpha. Generation, I get so confused with the generations. Gen Z. Yeah. Uh-huh. That's the one below millennials, right? Yes. Yes. So yeah. they're now, I think people still think of them as being teenagers, but some of them but are in their mid 20s. So they probably so. are, you know, they're getting their first or second job, looking at how mm-hmm. they can save the future. And obviously, some advisors are very switched on to this, but I think maybe a lot of them don't necessarily consider that. And it's a bit like what we were just talking about the intergenerational wealth thing. Mm-hmm. Some of those might be children or grandchildren of existing clients who. Mm-hmm. I don't, we don't need to go through all that again, but yeah, the, the advisors might want to start trying to build relationships with. Um, but also these younger generations of clients coming through are likely to want advice in a different way. So the most maybe obvious example is they might not want to have face like one, one face-to-face meeting a year. They might want to just check something quickly on WhatsApp an or an app or whatever. Um, yeah. So the the way that advice is delivered to even millennials um, is sort of different from maybe the previous generations. Um, Mm -hmm. And then I also spoke a bit about financial well-being, which is like something that maybe the younger generations are or the newer generations are more switched on to. I think people in, in general have become more aware of and switched on to mental health following the lockdowns that we went through Mm -hmm. a couple of years ago which seemed like decades ago now but actually it's only about what was it four years ago it started yeah Yeah. so I do think mental health as a general theme has massively risen up the agenda and alongside that obviously finance is massively tight what finance and mental health are hugely tied up together I've had quite Mm -hmm. a few conversations for you mentioned in conversation with uh, podcast Kim. I've had quite a few conversations with financial advisors and financial coaches who are sort of focused on financial well-being and how mindset affects money and how people get into debt when they're low. But then, you know, debt makes them it's sort of all tied up together. So yeah, that's another massive consideration. I think that if advisors aren't considering the well-being of their clients, they're kind of missing out on a massive opportunity to help. Um, And then that sort of goes hand in hand with just this idea of the financial plan as a whole. So not just recommending, you know, funds or products or investments Mm -hmm. or whatever, but thinking about what the client actually wants from life and Mm -hmm. not just how much money they might want to save or how much money they might want for retirement, but what they want to do. And then building a plan around that and, and sort of coming up with a figure based on that, I think, is a big, big theme. It's already started, but it's only going to get bigger as we go forward. Yeah. I also wonder if it's something like if they need to look. I know uh, Amanda probably talked about this um, last year about neurotypical versus neurodivergent clients, whether you also need to cater to that because they will probably a neurotypical person will look at their money 
completely differently from a neurodivergent person. If you're a person with ADHD, for example, your impulse control might not be great. So you also probably need to um, create a plan for that. But again, that's full fat advice, potentially. Yeah, exactly. Um, There's all these considerations. It's not as, not as simple as it once was or never. Seem, seemed to be. Yeah, seemed to be, because obviously this was always a thing. It was just never thought about. Um, so you just yeah. don't know who was struggling or not. Um, Tom, what about you? What are you looking forward to in February? <laughs> looking forward to is not quite the way I'd put it. Uh, I looked, <laughs> I was um, I was doing a, a section. My section for the, the cover feature was looking at global and domestic politics and how that right. would feed into... Um, the financial services, uh, economic predictions. Um, yeah, I mean it's coming back to the adjective. Are we going we back to twenty sixteen? Well, I, I, well, I can say is I hope not, but uh, certainly a lot of people are are looking in that way. It goes back to what we were saying about volatility, uncertainty. I mean, we came out of twenty twenty three and. When I joined money marketing, uh, what a lot of advisors were saying is what we need now is a sort of a period of calm, certainty, mm-hmm. kind of like a, a sort of a slow runway to back towards sort of some kind of normality. But mm-hmm. um, that is not really what we're getting in 2024. I mean, it's been touched on already about elections, um, mm-hmm. both in the UK and the US. And in fact, in depending on what source you look at, it's either 45 countries or 65 yeah. countries or 70 countries. Um, yeah, yeah. Suffice to say, there are a lot of elections happening this year and comprising yeah. a huge chunk of global GDP. Yeah. Um, a lot of those elections are very, very consequential, uh, such as the US one. Um mm-hmm. We've already seen the election election in Taiwan, um, but we've got, you know, which may well have an impact on um, the ongoing standoff with China. Mm-hmm. Um, but not just elections. I mean, global conflicts. I mean, both ones that are ongoing and ones that are are latent. Um, mm-hmm. And these are, by very nature, very, very, very difficult to predict. If we were sitting here this same time last year. I mean, the Israel-Palestine uh, problem has been going on for decades, but you wouldn't have mm-hmm. predicted it would have exploded in the way that it did now. It has yeah. done in this past year, mm-hmm. um, and then the knock-on effect of that with the um, the Houthi rebel attacks in the Red Sea, and then the counter blast against that. It, it's creating all kinds of and worries about Iran and. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it's not I mean, it's not conducive to great men- mental health. I really need to go yeah. back to what we were saying earlier. It, it is. It is from a from, from an economic point of view. A, 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 there is a lot that that could spook the markets, that could lead to more volatility, could infect, affect things like inflation or interest rates or whatever it may be. Mm-hmm. Um, in a way, the feature was it was an interesting one to 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 write. But on the other hand, it's it was a bit sort of where do you start? Not only where do you start, but how do you conclude? Because a lot of these mm. things are are moving targets. Um, and I think I just concluded the piece by saying, well, people were hoping for a bit of certainty and stability, and I'm afraid that's not really what they're, what, what they're going to get. And uh, yeah. very much watch this space. Yeah. Well, I feel like with situations like this, it's just always going to be inconclusive because we're mm. because there's human beings involved. Um, <laughs> you just never know what the plot twist might be. Yeah, always told I think us... Maybe- um, yeah. Always told as journalists not to conclude a feature with only time will tell, but it was really hard not to in that one. You see, I included it with only time will tell dot dot dot. <laughs> <laughs> Even it's more fine of a cliche, if you have a dot. But... Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes you know what? You I'm sure. These clues, I'm sure I finished my leader like that as well. Maybe it got subbed out. I think I probably not. <laughs> I have answer. concluded a few features like that, but I've said. Yeah. Um, I know you're not supposed to conclude like this, but I'm going to have to. Only time will tell. Uh, I so think a bit they, of a sort of meta said, ironic glass. <laughs> I think they set those rules though at a time when you could conclude with like a definitive answer, but now it's impossible to have a definitive answer or take a stance. I think mm. this is very so, true. Maybe, but I, I'm not sure. Maybe because I sort of first came to political consciousness in the kind of mid 90s, and looking back now, I kind of think oh, we had nothing to worry about back then. Everything was fine. <laughs> but I, I'm pretty sure we weren't saying that during at the time. time so. Yeah. 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 Uh, well, I don't know. I didn't really, I wasn't very conscious of anything outside of 
playing outside watching Power Rangers and listening to the Backstreet Boys in the 90s. I think that's um, pretty much what I was doing as well. But there oh, we well. <laughs> <laughs> Damn, let's go back to the 90s. Um, but uh, Darius, uh, what about you? What are you looking forward to in February, if there is anything to look forward to in February? Um, well, I suppose two things. One, it's my birthday, so I'm looking forward to that. Um, but I was also going to say I completely agree with the 90s uh, as a decade, Kim. It was a, it was an amazing time with Power Rangers and all that. Yeah, you can't beat that. But no, I, with, with my part of the cover feature, um, I covered um, costs and the, 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 where costs get low in 2024 for vice firms and uh, what people think. Uh, and um, so with regard to inflation, because obviously it's still – uh, an issue, and we're we, you know we're not quite um, at a two percent target yet. Um, and mm-hmm. we can see a slight increase. Um, that you know, everyone was saying you think inflation is obviously um, going to affect the cost of advice firms like every other business in the UK. But one thing that was quite a sort of a general consensus was uh, advice firms are quite good at, at not passing that cost on to the end client, like they do okay. sort of eat it as it were, absorb it. And you know, people say if if it was if it is passed on to the end client, then um, there needs to be sort of an improvement of a proposition for the client. It wouldn't just be like, oh, by the way, our fees have gone up by um, X percent. It, it would actually sort of back up by uh, trying to do something. So the, this advice firms would Well, yeah, very rarely, with the consumer yeah. duty, right? You have to show why you're doing that. Mm. So, yeah, so that's sort of, yeah. So that's, that's sort of the, yeah, again, the 2024 inflation is still there, but it w- that won't be the, the reason why um, clients will uh, see an increase. But yeah, no, consumer duty is, yeah, also could definitely play a part in that. And also, um, sort of, they sort of duty as well as a sort of a, put a downward pressure on, on fees and advice fees and so forth. And we saw SJP acts uh, extra fees last year and so forth. So, mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, again, it, it's sort of you know it's keeping sort of uh, pressure down on, on fees, but at the same time, in general, costs are increasing. So it is putting advice firms in a bit of a you know and a pinch sort of movement. Um, so, so yeah, people are you know aware or aware of that. You know, going for um, going to 2024, and and also a bit of a pace of consolidation is going to sort of maintain um, and. Um, Smaller consolidators backed by private equity a market is now into the market, and they were saying that you know previously you have a big consolidators weren't often considered smaller firms, mm-hmm. but um, you know the, the smaller consolidators will, and um, and now because quite a few firms have always been consolidated or be enough merger existing activity, and even the bigger consolidators might look into the, buying the smaller firms because they've you know they've sort of played their part with the. Uh, uh, of a larger size firm. So yeah, there'll be sort of more of a, a transition. Um, yeah, you know, that pace considered that pace is gonna maintain, but also it might now widen the scope of uh um <clears throat> the number and size of the com- uh, companies looking into these companies will be looking into buy. Okay. So more M and A's to look forward to this year. Yeah, I've, I've, yeah, I would is of the general because yeah, the general opinion is it will maintain. They don't see any reason why it's It'll suddenly going to pop. Yeah, it's is is going to carry on. Uh, at the very good. least, yeah. I'd put on a I'd put on quite a large bet that it'll increase. Yeah, because people will be like, yeah, I think I'm done. I'm good. Yeah. You can absorb my business. <laughs> Only time will tell. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but talking about M and A's, and obviously, um, I don't. Okay, I'm trying to do a good link somehow. But um, there's been a lot of talk about uh, the advisor gap in terms of there's not enough financial advisors out there to fill the ones who are going to be retiring in the upcoming years, which will leave a lot of clients lost essentially um so in collaboration with money marketing um there we have launched a community uh future financial advisor uh which will help guide not only um students who are leaving you know sixth form um but also the second careerists who are part qualified and looking for more guidance uh in that community you're able to get so much information on uh, how to follow down a path of financial advice, which is, as we've talked about multiple times, um, it's a career that 
not everyone knows about. Your regular 18 year old has no idea what a financial advisor is. And yet it is such a fulfilling career, which will make you quite good money as well and allow you to meet fascinating people along the way. Um, so we we've been able to help develop that community and we're excited to see it grow and also help boost that advisor gap and fill those 50,000 uh, jobs that are out there and necessary to be filled. So yeah. Brilliant. Exciting. For, yeah, exactly. Look out for a future financial advisor, um, follow, uh, go to the website and everything for all the resources out there. Um, and also another shout out to our upcoming conference in Leeds, Money, Money, Money marketing. Money, money, money. <laughs> money, money, money. That's what we're going to get there. That's what you can get when you go there. But Money Marketing Interactive Leads. Uh, we're back again up in Leeds. It's an exciting uh, program that we have. I don't know if anyone has anything that they want to give a sneak peek into what we'll be talking about. I know it's seismic activity that's going on there. Well, I'm quite excited to. I think we've used excited a lot now. I'm yeah. intrigued. Now it's going to be excited. It was interesting. That's excited. Okay. Yeah. I'm intrigued to hear from a panel about technology yeah. um, because I think that's a really fascinating area. You know, how advice firms are using technology and specifically AI to mm -hmm. make their businesses more efficient. So we don't know or we can't reveal who's going to be speaking on that panel yet, but I think that's definitely one to watch, watch out, out for. for that's mm -hmm. one that I'm particularly interested in also yeah. um the conference is the day before my birthday so I'm excited stick around it. and celebrate Laura's birthday for my, for my uh, big party yeah. after <laughs> yeah ninth so of May. that is ninth of May Exactly. So make sure to go over to Money Marketing's website so that you can register and secure your seat at one of the best conferences of the year. Um, but I'm going to wrap it up now. Thank you guys for joining me today. That This was a really great first podcast of the year. And I look forward to talking to you guys again next month. Yay. Thank you, Kim. Thank you. Thanks, Kim. Thank you. Thanks,